everybody. Welcome into a glitch in the matrix. I am your host. I'm Jessica Jones, the cryptid huntress. I am so glad you guys are here today. And, uh, and I see you guys in the chat. Thank you all for being here. And thank you to my moderators who are already kicking it up in that chat. Um, y'all know how to moderate. Like I always say, I love y'all. Okay. I have such a fantastic show for us today. I have the Vic Cundiff in the studio today. Uh, for those of you who don't know, which I, I think most people know Vic, um, he has an incredible YouTube channel. He has several uh, different platforms and channels, uh, but Dogman Encounters is the most popular uh, in also my Bigfoot sighting and uh, the Bigfoot radio. He's got podcasts. We're going to talk about that in just a little bit. Okay, so I've got Vic here. We're going to talk about some of his personal cryptid experiences and all the hundreds of dogman reports that he's taken from all over the country. Oh my gosh, it is amazing. Okay, I cannot wait to get the show started. Uh, if you guys would like to follow along with what I do, I have a really great website where I post all of my um, shows that I'm going to be having. I try to do it the day prior. Y'all know I'm a last minute kind of girl. I'm so busy. Um, and I'm doing a lot of shows all the time. So I post uh, usually the day or night before what I'm going to have on my show. Uh, the next day. That's all on my website. Also, any events that I'm going to be speaking at, presenting at, those are on my website as well. Okay, so uh, y'all go check that out. That's thecryptidhunters.com. It's down here on the ticker. Also, if you'd like to support what I do, I have a Patreon, and that's the Cryptid Huntress over on Patreon. And uh, yes, thank you to all of my Patreon members, all my new Patreon members. Uh, it is so appreciated, and uh, and I'm very humbled that you guys support me as much as y'all do. Uh, also, I do have a shop that's called War Woman Goods. Y'all can get the best of vintage turquoise, Native American jewelry, and other vintage stuff. So uh, y'all can check that out as well. Thank you guys so much again for your support. All right. I don't want to waste any time because I have so many questions today, and uh, we have a lot to talk about. Um, today, I have Vic Cundiff here, and let me give him a formal introduction. Vic Cundiff has always been fascinated with cryptids and has been interested in the things that go bump in the night for as long as he can remember. He spoke with his first dogman eyewitness in 2007 and has spoken with countless eyewitnesses since. Some days he's contacted through dogmanencounters.com with as many as seven or eight new eyewitnesses he's never heard of from or heard from before. My goodness, that's a lot. He helps Dogman eyewitnesses come to terms with their encounters and is the host of a podcast called Dogman Encounters, where eyewitnesses share the details of encounters they've had with dogmen. In addition to the work he does trying to help the dogman eyewitnesses, he also produces two Bigfoot-specific podcasts and one paranormal theme podcast. The Bigfoot podcasts are called My Bigfoot Sighting and Bigfoot Eyewitness Radio. The paranormal podcast is called My Paranormal Experience. All four of his podcasts are available for listening on your favorite podcast platform. And I was just on Bigfoot Eyewitness Radio this weekend. So y'all please go tune into that. It's all over my social media. Please help me welcome to A Glitch in the Matrix today, Vic Cundiff. Well, hey, Vic. Hey, Jess. Thanks so much for having me on. Well, thank you for being here. Man, this has been a long time coming. I've been wanting to uh, host you on my show for a long time. And, uh, and I finally got you here. So thank you so much for spending your what is this wednesday afternoon with me oh you're welcome i just wish you would have asked me on sooner but i've got to ask you though yeah. jess by me agreeing to come on the show today is that going to put a glitch into my matrix you're already in you're already glitchy you're glitchy yes you're you're in your <laughs> matrix my matrix aren't the entire matrix of the entire universe yes uh we're we're making ripples today vic for sure i can guarantee that <laughs> Okay. <laughs> that we are. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Oh my gosh. Yes. Okay. So before we get started, I got to ask you of all the cryptids, I know you take a lot of Dogman reports. You've had your own Bigfoot experience. What is your favorite cryptid of all time? I mean, at, out of all the cryptids, not just Bigfoot and Dogman, what's your favorite? Well, that's kind of a, a loaded answer I've got ready for you. My most interesting, the cryptid I find most interesting is definitely dogmen, but definitely not my favorite. I hate dogmen. I hate what they do <laughs> to these eyewitnesses. Of course, we're just seeing a, a just a glimpse into what the, the total number of dogmen out there do. I mean, I'm sure most of them don't terrorize people and, and try to ruin lives and all that, but yeah, I'm exposed to the ones that do things like that, that do go out of their way to try and 
terrify these poor eyewitnesses to within an inch of their lives. And you can only talk with so many people who have encountered these guys and been mortified unnecessarily. So with that, in not have a hate for these guys and what they do. So yeah, they're not my favorite by a long shot, but I do think they're the most interesting. I used to host a Sasquatch specific podcast back in 2008, I think it was in 2009. It was called Campfire Shadows. And back then I did that because I was just really drawn to the whole Sasquatch phenomenon. But after I found out about Dogman, what drew me to Sasquatch, it was magnified by 10 or more with Dogman. I just find them more interesting, more frightening to think about and, and all of that. And they're more, when encounters happen with these guys, it seems like there's normally more to it. So, yeah, I've always been more drawn to them than Sasquatch after I found out about them. Yeah, well, you know what I've noticed? Being a show host and doing putting a lot of content out there and also being a field researcher. Uh, I've been a Bigfoot field researcher for almost 12, or 12 years or more now. And, uh, and so I know that Bigfoot is real. OK, I've experienced Bigfoot. I talked about it on your podcast over the weekend. And uh, and so and, and, you know, I think that dog man shows that I do get a lot more. Th there's a lot more interest in those. I mean, not not like a ton, but there's a, there's more interest in dog man. Like they get more views. And, I, and I've noticed a lot of other podcasters will put it out there like dog man attacks, you know, and those those views like skyrocket on YouTube. Oh because everybody is so interested in Dogman. Um, and, and I feel like, big, I'm not saying Bigfoot gets left behind by any means. But uh, there are so many videos and eyewitness accounts of Bigfoot. And it's been around for so long. I feel like Dogman's kind of the new big thing. You know, uh, there's more sightings. People are coming forward more often to talk about them. What do you think about that? Do you think that it's because they're just more mysterious or more violent or what? No, there is definitely something to that. No one can look away from the car crash. Fright sells, yeah. and dogmen, they bring fright in droves. So, yeah, that's why they're the end thing now. They're the hot cryptid. They're still not as big as Sasquatch, but, yeah, they're the new end cryptid right now. And I think it's just going to get bigger and bigger as time goes by. But, yeah, I mean there are negative things that come along with that. Just like when Dobermans became the dog to have back in the 70s. You had all these backyard breeders who were breeding these really poor specimens with all these issues. Well, with dogmen being such a hot topic now, you've got negative things that come along with that as well, such as you've got all these shows out there that are every time you turn around, and you just touched on this, Every time you turn around, there's a new video popping up on YouTube about this dog man that slaughtered this person or this dog man that will rip your eyes out and suck your brains out through the, the cavity yeah. and all these made up stories. Well, it's OK to make creepy pasta. There's nothing wrong with creepy pasta at all. But I mean, if I had a nickel for every time I spoke with an eyewitness, a dog man eyewitness who had an encounter of their own, and then they listened to this crap this made up crap that wasn't presented for what it was, just a made up story. And again, like I said, if it was presented as creepypasta, just a made up story, wouldn't have a problem whatsoever with it. But when these poor eyewitnesses who are already barely hanging on, listen to this crap and take those stories as being real, well, okay, that makes them think that the dogmen that they encountered were that much more dangerous and and whatnot, and just makes it that much more difficult for them to come to terms with their encounters. That's when I have to come in and talk with them and explain to them, look, the siege at Lockett Ranch never happened. And all these other made up stories, bogus stories about dogmen attacking people, they didn't happen. I'm never going to say that dogmen haven't attacked people because, yes, I've got no doubts whatsoever they have. And I've spoken with six or seven eyewitnesses over the years I've been doing this that that I definitely do believe are credible in word telling the truth. But let's frame it up here. I've spoken with thousands upon thousands of dogman eyewitnesses since I spoke with that first eyewitness back in 2007. Well, if 
I've spoken with so many dogman eyewitnesses and the grand total of credible eyewitnesses I've spoken with over the years who have ever told me about being harmed, intentionally harmed by a dogman or dogmen that they've bumped into. If that number is six or seven, then that right there tells you how rare, how much of a rarity oh. it is for these guys to actually attack. And then when you've got someone else, you, every time you turn around every other week, it's another story about this dogman attack, this killer dogman that's going to break into your home and tear your head off and all this. If I deal with the numbers that I deal with and someone who deals with less than 10% of the eyewitnesses I do, and every other week they're coming out with a new dogman attack story that they're presenting as being factual, then yeah, that tells you everything you need to know about this. I mean, every time I turn around, you've got someone else who's contacting me trying to tell me about this attack that they suffered. Well, when you dig into it, the story, in almost every case, it just doesn't hold up. The most recent case of that was this guy who contacted me from Kentucky, talked about how he had been horseback riding with friends. He was the last one in line, and he said they were going up this long, gradual hill, and all of a sudden he noticed off to his right, I think it was, there was this huge dog man that came walking up next to him. And it was so big, he said it was looking him in his eye. Well, he said it swiped him across the chest and knocked him off his horse. And, and then when it did that, it left these deep gashes across his chest naturally. And when he said that, I asked him, okay, I'm sure you had to go to the hospital to get treatment for those wounds, didn't you? And he said, yeah, I sure did. I said, well, if that's the case, did the hospital take any pictures of the wounds that you could send me? Or did you take pictures of the wounds that you could send me? And he said, yeah, I sure did, or they sure did. I can't remember which. And when he said that he had pictures of the wounds, I said, okay, great. Well, if that's the case, and yeah, please do send those to me. I want to take a look at them. Well, after I got off the phone with him, that was the first conversation we had, I kind of networked, I guess you could say, and I arranged so that two very well-tenured trauma surgeons who are based out in Colorado, who specialize in, guess what, dealing with large predator attacks on humans. Well, yeah. who better than them to evaluate the validity of these so-called wounds in the pictures on his chest? Well, when I contacted him back, because I wasn't going to just take these pictures and automatically forward those to the trauma surgeons without his permission, when I asked him if it would be okay to send these pictures to these well-tenured, very experienced trauma surgeons to get their professional opinion, he left skid marks getting out of there. He didn't want any part of these people evaluating those wounds in the pictures and all. And that's the way it is. Time after time, once in a great while, you'll have someone who's legit. But that's almost always how it is. People trying to lie the way onto the show. So. Oh, Back gosh. I mean, yeah, when you check out these shows and see that every time you turn around, they're putting someone else out there who is this poor dog man attack victim. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You oh, no. this before believing that. Oh, wow. Well, you know, you got to go with your gut with some of the people who are giving these reports. And I, I don't like having to discount anybody's reports because everybody who's had a sighting, most of the majority of people that I've heard about, they were like super, but like kind of but not benevolent, but kind of indifferent when it came to the dog man, uh, their reaction to the humans, the dog man's reaction to them. Uh, they just kind of stood there and looked at them and may have put off some kind of an energy to them. Like, you know, I can mess you up if I if I want to, but I won't, <laughs> you know, so yeah. it's not it's not as though a lot of people are getting attacked. Now, the only attacks that I have actually, you know, I do this remote viewing stuff and um, I have been tasked with some targets of alleged dogman attacks and uh half the time the attacks were actually big cats from what i could tell and mm -hmm. um and uh and of course there's some key stories you know uh, some of the accounts like the lbl that's a famous one right um that everybody talks about um and ronald nelson thank you for that super chat i appreciate that um but you know <laughs> the majority of the accounts that we get of, of people encountering a dogman are not violent I mean, in, in my experience so far. You're right. You're right. Now you get people who say, well, Vic is full of it by seeing that these guys aren't wired to attack on site because he only speaks to a fraction of the eyewitnesses who have encounters with these guys. And if they attack a person and kill them, then that person can't come forward and talk about the attack. And that's true. 
but I base my opinion on them not being clearly not being wired to attack humans on site by, like I said, the thousands on thousands of eyewitnesses who were caught dead to rights in compromising situations where if the dogmen that they encountered were wired to attack people on site, those people would have been wiped off the map, but they were allowed to leave without a single hair in their heads being harmed. So that right there is what tells me that these guys most definitely are not wired to attack people on sight. Now, again, I'm going to qualify those comments by saying I'm never going to say that dogmen are safe to be around because any <laughs> critter with teeth and or claws, Jess, as you know, if you push the wrong buttons, if they got off on the wrong, maybe that morning they got up on the wrong side of the log. You never know. They might attack you. Or you might have a dangerous specimen. You name the species of animal out there, from pigs to horses to goats, camels, you name it, dogs, cats, you name the species that doesn't have examples of dangerous individuals. There are horses that will kill you if you go into a pen with them, if you go close to them. There are pigs that are dangerous like that, camels like that. So why people like that even? So why should dogmen be any different? You are going to have deviant examples of any species out there. So yeah, you will have dangerous dogmen as well, but it's clear that they're not wired to be that way. That's not what you should expect when you encounter any dogmen. Because again, the numbers clearly show that's not the case. But they're also very scary and that can be traumatic to people who see them. And, you know, especially grown men who've, you know, you're seeing something you're not supposed to see. So the first reaction they're going to have is to want to unalive it, as they say on YouTube. Okay. And, uh, and so I've actually had people on my show, I've had at least one person who spoke publicly about, un let's say unaliving for YouTube purposes, a dog man and, uh, and, and, I call it critter control is what the the term that I started using for it. Um, do you get reports like that very often of where people have actually shot them and, um, and, and, you know, critter controlled the dog men. Once in a blue moon, I have someone contact me and tell me that they, they took a shot at a dog man. Normally it doesn't get the desired effect. Normally it's, it just, it's clear it hit the dog man, but they don't drop. They're not all that affected by it. I mean, Dave Lighty, he talked about in that one instance when he was driving through, I think it was the Black Swamp in South Carolina, I think it was, where he pulled out his 357 and shot one in the shoulder. And it was just like someone had punched it. And that's all there was to it. So, yeah, once in a blue moon, I'll have someone contact me and tell me they did that, but not very often at all. Wow. Yeah. Some say that they're bulletproof. I mean, I've, I've heard that before that the bullets just kind of bounce right off of them. And I guess it depends on what caliber you're using. Okay. So um, I don't know. I know that I don't go into the woods unprotected uh, because I know the dangers out there and it's not just dogmen and Bigfoot. It's cats, big cats and humans. I'm more scared of humans than I am a Bigfoot out there to be quite honest, Vic. Yeah. Oh no, you're right. I mean, yeah, there are some pretty dangerous people out there. And like you said, hogs and other things too, mountain lions. So yeah, you've got to keep your head on the swivel. That's right. That's right. Now, what do you think about these unspecified animal attacks? Have you heard about a lot of those over the past few years? I mean, because recently we've had some reports coming out of, well, from all over the country. And, uh, and I've done shows on them where they say that packs of wild dogs are, you know, I'm just going to say killing people. Okay. Um, and people are very suspicious of that and they think that it could be dog man. What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, once in a blue moon, have I had someone contact me who told me about seeing more than one dog man together. And when you think about how things work, it only makes sense that these guys do not travel in numbers. I mean, unlike Sasquatch, you are omnivores. These guys, it's clear because of the teeth in their head that they're obligate carnivores. And if you're an obligate carnivore of any size, mountain lion, bears, you name it. Well, bears are omnivores, but tigers, you name any large omnivore, they're going to have a huge home range because if they stayed in one particular area very long due to their caloric daily requirements, 
they would deplete all the resources. That's why a large carnivore can't stay in one spot too long. Well, if you have more than one large carnivore hanging out together, that's just going to compound that problem like you wouldn't believe. So it just wouldn't make sense that they wouldn't hang out in numbers. And also, too, yeah, wolves, they hang out in numbers, but number one, they're not that big. And number two, to dispatch the prey that they take down, it requires numbers and teamwork, so they have to live together. But dog men, they've got the size, the strength, the weapons, the intelligence to take down anything they want to take down and feed on. So there's no requirement for them to hang out in numbers. So, yeah, I just, for those reasons, I just don't think that they make a habit out of doing that. But, yeah, these reports of supposed dog attack victims who are killed by dogs. Yeah, that might be a situation where a rogue dog man took someone down and killed them, unfortunately. There was that one boy in Kentucky, I forgot his name. I think Martin Groves. Well, yeah, I think that was a dog man that killed him, unfortunately. Like I said, I think these guys do occasionally kill people. And I think there are rogue dogmen out there who are just dangerous by nature, who will kill you if they have the opportunity. So, yeah, I do think it happens to answer your question. And it's yes. so convenient to just blame it on feral dogs instead of saying what really did it. I think that's what it is. is behind all this. Yeah. And for clarification, Martin Groves is alive today. It was a bow hunter, I believe, uh, that he witnessed that he, he had encountered the, the day before uh, who who he said was um who died and under mysterious circumstances. So yeah, very interesting stuff. Now, speaking of the power of dogmen, uh, do you believe that our military, our government agencies, uh, any kind of, let's just say agencies, it doesn't even have to be government, uh, is use, utilizing dogmen and let's just say werewolves. And we'll make a distinction between dogmen and werewolves today as well, Vic, uh, if, if we can. And uh, yeah, would, because, some people say that there's even a dogman breeding program going on uh, here. And and who's to say? I don't know. because I, I've never had an eyewitness account, but I've heard some online before. So what do you think about that? Well, before I address that, let me go back and apologize. Yeah, I think Martin Groves is a researcher, and that's not the name of the boy. There was a boy in Kentucky who was dragged up this mountain and killed. I think whatever it was, attacked his stomach and the boy was alive when he was being eaten or whatever, but oh. yeah, there was a boy who was killed in Kentucky. That's the one I was talking about. And again, I apologize. Yeah, his name is not Martin Groves, like you said, but to answer your question, gosh, I guess it's possible, but I think more so more likely than not, what you're looking at is I think that's probably something that was made up because if the government actually was, behind a program like that, I just don't think that they're going to let that kind of a secret get out. I really don't. And if you do have a program, a breeding program, where these guys are used as biological weapons, there, there are so many problems that come along with that. I mean, what if they're filmed when they're doing what they're programmed to supposedly do? They're being deployed overseas. What if this happens? What if that happens? There are so many moving parts to a program like that. I just don't think with all of our technology that we would ever have any use for them doing that sort of thing. I really don't. Yeah. Well, you know, I I get a lot of guests on and uh, and people, we've had a lot of discussions on that. And uh, and it, it, to me, it seems like it, you know, considering what I know, let's just put it that way, considering what I know and the things that I've experienced myself, um, I think it could be possible. So, I, but, but like I said, I don't know. I don't have firsthand uh, knowledge of that. But, you know, I have people who claim to be insiders and stuff that kind of, um, well, kind of offhandedly claim to be insiders uh, that are contacting me and kind of f telling me stuff like that. So um, it's just food for thought, as my friend Barry Littleton says. He's in the chat today. Hey, Barry. Um, it's definitely food for thought. And, uh, and it would be the ultimate soldier, don't you think, Vic? Yeah, that would make for a pretty formidable soldier, no doubt about yeah. that. But how can you guarantee they're not going to turn on our troops and, and start doing things that you don't want them to do to, to escape the area where these bad soldiers are and then go into whatever city, major city is closest by and start slaughtering people? Yeah, imagine trying to That's keep true. that off of the news. So, yeah, there are a lot of moving parts that come along with doing something like that, that the government is way too smart to to fall for and 
and not think through. So it's possible, but you know, for the aforementioned reasons, I really doubt that that's going on. Vic, what about shock collars? I'm just kidding. No, that's some <laughs> states they do have shock collars and stuff. So, um, and, and it's just, I think it could be just trying to rationalize the idea of having a dog man super soldier. Like, how do you control them? Shock collars, you know, because you got to put like a, you know, an everyday dog kind of connotation to it. So I don't know. It's just a lot to think about. And it, it, it is, it seems very serious, but it's also kind of humorous at the same time. But if it is serious, if it is real, this is a serious issue. Seriously, serious, serious. So oh, sure. um, yeah, I, I think it's, uh, I think it's interesting to talk about though. And who better to talk about this with today than you, Vic? So uh, you've taken over, I mean, what, like 400 reports by now or, or well over 300 uh, dogman reports, right? Well, I've taken thousands and thousands, thousands over the years, but yeah, you know, on Dogman shows. Encounters yeah. Radio, we're up to what episode four eighty two this Friday. So yeah, oh that's just the tip of the iceberg. Most of these people who have encounters, they don't have any interest in coming on the show, so you're never going to hear from them. But and there's no pressure to ever do a show. I mean, when people reach out to me, it's sad to me to think to ever think that they're under this. They feel under an obligation to come on the show if they try to get help with their encounters, because yeah, that's, that couldn't be further from the truth. That's just not how it is. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Well, I mentioned werewolves. I did mention werewolves a while ago. Uh, there is a difference between a werewolf and a dog man. And we've talked about it on my shows before. Um, and it's not only the way they look, but it's their size. And some people say that werewolves shape shift from humans into werewolves. What is your idea of a werewolf? Because it seems like everybody, I'm not going to say everybody's an expert on it because I'm not an expert at all. But I, anytime that I, I talk about it and we kind of throw ideas out there, somebody's always trying to correct or something. They're like, no, a werewolf is this, you know. Um, oh I believe, boy. I've been, I, in my mind, I thought werewolves were shapeshifters and shaped from, you know, like a human who shapeshifted into a werewolf. But lately I've been told that no, a werewolf was born a werewolf and oh it dies boy. a werewolf. What do you think about that? What do I think? Oh boy. Yes. What is your opinion? Ever since I've gotten into this, one of the things that I've just laughed and laughed about is how every time you turn around, you've got people trying to redefine things when it comes to these guys. You've got mm -hmm. people like the ones you just mentioned that are trying to redefine the meaning of werewolf. No people. A werewolf is a human that if they actually existed, a werewolf is defined as being a person who somehow is able to magically transform from the form of a human to that of a beast that looks like basically a dog man or what we know to be a werewolf. It's not something that's born looking like that. It's not something that as these experts who somehow magically can tell you how many hairs a, a werewolf has per square inch on its body. They can tell you, oh, a werewolf has 200 hairs per square inch on their body and a dog man has 100 hairs per square inch in their body and they can tell you how a werewolf smells different from a dog man a dog man smells like popcorn and a werewolf when it gets popcorn. angry it smells like peaches yeah this is just is that the serious? insanity that's floating People around that. well every I, time i, I turn around that. i see these preposterous claims from these people who claim to be insiders who are in the know they know about dog men it's almost like they supposedly are hanging out inside of a cage at a government facility with these guys. And that's why there are these experts on these guys. There are no experts when it comes to dog men. And if werewolves actually existed, there are no experts on them. But I can tell you, trying to redefine things, I mean, that's a pretty, pretty big step to try and redefine what a, a werewolf actually is when it's already been defined. Again, as a person who can somehow magically transform into the form of a beast, it's not something that's born looking that way at birth, like I said. These are just people who are trying to move the goal line. It's no different than that. That's exactly what it is. You know, well, when in all my years of researching, Vic, I got to say, like, I I don't even like labeling things anymore because a lot of times when we're out there and we're studying Sasquatch, we have all these other critters, okay, critters, and I, and I mean that in the nicest way, uh, other big gigantic animals out there that may not be exactly a Sasquatch or a dog man. It could be anything. We even have goat men out there. I mean, but it, there's so many different 
things. Anything is possible in my mind. So we try not to label if we can help it. Um, and so when it kind of comes down to dog man versus werewolf versus shapeshifter to what, it's really fun to look into all this stuff because um, people have different opinions. But yeah, I do agree with you. There are like, um, I don't want to say like I've, I've encountered some word police lately and stuff too. So, but we're not going to go there today. Um, when it comes to the term terminology of like the way we're out there researching, honestly, I just have fun researching. I'm not trying to get technical. Okay. I'm just out there having fun. I'm enjoying everybody's stories and uh, y'all call yourselves what you want. If you want to be boots on the ground or field researchers or whatever, uh, it's, it's all good in my book. So, uh, but anyways, yeah, I, I do. I do see that Vic. I see that um, changing the terminologies and stuff. Well, it's just confusing to me because I'm over here trying to figure these things out. And now I'm like, well, now werewolf's not what I thought it was. Okay. Yeah. So. What I really think is behind it. There's a, an individual who has claimed to be this government operative, who's an insider who decided to basically go rogue and start revealing things about oh, yeah. what the government is actually doing, who's been featured regularly on another show, who, in my opinion, it seems like they started this nonsense about, okay, this is what a werewolf is. A werewolf is born looking the way it does, and a werewolf is looks this way compared to a dog man and and whatnot. And then you've got people who listen to that and unfortunately believe this guy. And then that's why you've got so many people out there now who, who think they know that, okay, well, werewolves do look that way when they're born. And they have all the stuff that they'll be able to tell you about werewolves when in fact they bought into a charlatan's lies and now they've been misled and they're spreading those lies for that charlatan. So yeah, oh I don't put any weight into that. And I'm with you. I mean, werewolves might be a reality. People who who have the ability to transform, shapeshift into the form of what looks like a, a werewolf as we know it, they might be out there. Anything's possible in this crazy world. But yeah, as oh. far as people who will tell you that, quote unquote, werewolves look the same all the time. Well, yeah, that, that's werewolves have already been defined. So yeah, that just isn't the case. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's good to know. Thank you for that information now. Uh, we do have a question, Vic. Uh, Jeff Adams says, I'm pleased to ask you about the connection with people who have had near-death experiences and dogman encounters. Is there a connection? That's a really good question. Yeah, I've told an eyewitness about this like two, three days ago when I was on the phone with him. If you have an NDE, that most definitely does seem to, to predispose you much more so than the average person who has not to having an encounter with a dog man. Maybe they do have some kind of a supernatural element to them. I mean, there are a lot of things pointing towards that being a fact about these guys. And if they do have supernatural qualities, maybe they are drawn to people who have seen the other side. So yeah, it seems like there's something to that. I don't know exactly what, like I said, but there definitely does seem to be something to that. I have an idea. Okay. I have an idea because I like to say that Bigfoot sightings or any kind of cryptid sightings are raising the consciousness of everybody on this planet, one sighting at a time. Okay. And, and to me, everything is about energy and frequency and vibration. Okay. And so, you know, when they say that whenever someone has an encounter with a dog man or a Sasquatch, uh, they get tagged is what people call it. Okay. Well, I like to think that it's not just they're getting tagged. What I believe is that they are jolted into this frequency. They're on that frequency to be at that moment to see that being, that creature. Okay. And when they're on that free, when you get on that frequency and you can see each other, whatever that vibrational frequency is, you're on it. You're kind of stuck there. Okay. Like you're there, you're vibrating on it at this point. Now you're open to everything. Like now you can see them and you're probably never going to stop seeing them. <laughs> Okay. Unless you go hide under a rock somewhere, you don't want to have that experience anymore. Uh, I do believe it kind of opens you up to that frequency. Uh, and that's what I think it is, but I'm, I, I don't claim to be right. I don't always know what I'm talking about, but that's just my opinion. Um, and, and that's what I think. So I think a near death experience uh, would put you in that frequency of, you know, just like seeing ghosts. Okay. You see your passed over loved ones and, uh, and Vic, I know you have a, your paranormal channel, you have your Bigfoot channel, uh, you're very in tune with like all the paranormal, every facet. Um, and so 
Yeah, I think I think that you're able to pick up on all the things that are in that vibrational vibrational frequency once you get to that frequency. Yeah, that makes sense. That would make good sense. <laughs> maybe, maybe. But uh, yeah, I, I just think that's really cool, though, uh, the near-death experiences. And I, and I have my friend Barry in here. He's had a near-death experience or two. Uh, I, think a, I think a few people have in here. And I think it does open you up to not only the cryptids, uh, but even to your enhanced human capabilities, as I call them, like telepathy and stuff like that. Do you think dogmen have telepathy? Well, they might. I mean... There have been a lot of credible eyewitnesses who I've spoken with over the years who reported mind speak. So with the dog man, maybe they do have the ability to do that. We really don't know what the extent, what the limits of their abilities are. So anything's possible when it comes to these guys, in my opinion. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Now you have had your own personal experiences, Vic, with cryptids, particularly potentially Bigfoot. Would you like to tell me and the audience today a little bit about some of your experiences? Sure. Yeah, be glad to. This is something I've kind of kept on the down low for years since I got into this because I didn't want to be the next person jumping in and, and kind of throwing their cryptid related experiences out there. And I don't know for sure that these two were definitely cryptid experiences, but if they're not, if the first one especially is not. It's really hard to explain away as being something else. I guess I'll just dive into that first one and make you uh, do the best I can to help you understand why I say that. Okay. Well, thank you. Over. Oh, and thank you, Long Island Bigfoot. Our buddy at Long Island Bigfoot's in the chat today. Before you start, I'm so sorry. Thank you for that super chat. Uh, you guys go check out um, Long Island Bigfoot on uh, Vic's show, uh, Dogman Encounters. Okay. That was about a week or two ago. Uh, go check that out. All right, Vic, hey, go Mike. ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, Mike's no problem. Hey, Mike, hope you're having a great day. Yeah. What's up, Mike? Well, <laughs> to dive into that first encounter, this was over 40 years ago. And basically, I had a neighbor that was a few doors down who I think he was already in his 70s back then. This man, I mean, he was like the definition of an outdoorsman. I mean, you name it, and he had done it. I mean, he had hunting story after hunting story to tell, and he had been all these places and done all these things out in the woods and everything. Well, always being a sucker for a good story and also loving the outdoors, animals, you name it, wilderness, I was just drawn to this guy. Well, I would go down there and sit on that man's couch and and listen to story after story to the point where he would actually pull out his newspaper, I guess is my hint that <laughs> it was time for me to go home. But anyway, yeah, he would talk about all these experiences he had. And one time, even after going down there for years, one time he told me about this one bear attack. He said, oh, by the way, did I ever tell about the time I was attacked by a bear when I was deer hunting in the Upper Peninsula? I said, what? You were attacked by a bear? You're going to come at me with that now? <laughs> he said, yeah, I sure was. And I, was, I guess I must have been making faces or something like that. And he could tell that I just wasn't having it. Next thing I know, he holds his leg up, pulls up his pant leg, and shows me. You could see in his calf, there were like pock marks. They were like, you could see the print, tooth mark, wounds of a bear, a bear's teeth where a bear had clearly bitten him on the leg. I thought, holy cow, this guy is the real deal. You were attacked by a bear. Yeah, he told me that he was hunting deer up in the Upper Peninsula. He was stalk hunting, and he was in this really dense pine grove, and all of a sudden he got this feeling like he was being watched. So he dropped down on the ground and started looking around underneath the, the trees to try and see what in the world was around. Maybe there was something making him feel that way. Well, yeah, there was a bear some distance away. He could see that there was a bear, a black bear, that was actually doing the same thing he was doing. It was crouched down, looking under the trees, looking right at him. And as soon as he made eye contact with it, he said it charged him, knocked him down, and it bit him on his leg there. That's how he got that wound. Well, after hearing all these stories, he posed the idea eventually. He said, you know what, Vic, you've got all this interest in the outdoors and animals, and you love my hunting stories. 
why don't I take you to the farm? He had this farm that was way out in the country. I mean, way out in the sticks in the middle of absolute nowhere. He said, why don't you get your, your hunting license? And there's plenty of time for you to get it before the season comes in. And that way we can leave here and we can do some hunting on the farm when the season does come in this November. I said, well, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. So I went and took the hunter safety course and got my hunter's license and everything, and hunting license, I should say. And then, yeah, we left out the day before his season came in, and we got settled in into his farmhouse and all that. And he was kind of basically explaining how things were going to work the next morning when we set out bright and early and what I needed to do when I was out there and all this stuff. Well, yeah, the next morning came and bright and early we got up like an hour or so before dawn, maybe an hour and a half and had breakfast. And then next thing I know, we're heading out. So we we started heading out and I guess I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. As we were pulling up to his farmhouse, he knew how much I loved horses. Well, I saw that he had two bays out there and when he heard me make a comment about them, he said, well, yeah, this one right here is so-and-so. I forgot that horse's name. He's fine to be around. But this one here past him is Red. Don't even think about going near Red because he's dangerous. He will hurt you. Maybe even kill you. So stay away from Red. I said, understood. No problem. All right. So now it's the day of hunting season. We're heading out into the darkness and it was dark, dark. Cause like I said, he just lived in the middle of nowhere. So we walked and walked and walked and he made it clear. I'm going to take you way out to this one spot where I'm going to have you sit. And that's going to be where you're going to stay and you're going to hunt until I come get you right before dark. So remember everything I told you and everything will be fine. So like I said, we walked and walked and walked, went down this hollow, up the other side of the hollow, up, down, up, down, way out until we finally came to this one huge oak tree that was halfway down the side of this huge hollow. And he said, okay, this is your spot. This is where you're going to stay until I come get you this evening, right before dark. Remember what I told you and everything will be fine. So, you know, I got settled in and he left. Well, I sat there and I sat there and for too long, the sun came up and I just sat and sat and sat and there was no action. I mean, nothing was going on. And I guess it was probably around noon or so. I didn't check the time all that often because that would be unnecessary movement. And like he told me, he didn't want to move any more than you needed to. Well, sometime, I guess, after noonish or so, I was sitting there. But all of a sudden, maybe 15, 20, maybe 25 feet behind me up the slope of the hollow I was sitting on, I hear this loud horse whinny, loud horse whinny. And when I heard that, I just froze and thought, oh my gosh, is that red? Did red follow us all the way out here? And then not long after that, I heard this horse blow. If you've been around horses, you know that normally when they have a little bit of dust in their nostrils, they'll do the normal clearing that everyone knows. But when they have something that's going to require more attention to get out of their nostrils, horses can't breathe through their mouths. They can only breathe through their nostrils. So that makes it even more important for them to keep them clear. Well, that's why occasionally when a horse gets something up there that a normal clearing won't get the clog out or whatever, I guess you could say, they do a blow and it can be loud. It just depends on how much force they put behind it. But if they really get into it, it'll scare you out of your boots. Well, yeah, that's what I heard behind me was this loud blow. I mean, it was ridiculously loud and I actually felt a concussion from it. If you're around what? horses that do a big blow, you'll actually feel a kind of concussion from it because of their lung volume. Well, wow. The sound I heard when I heard this blow, there's no way I'm a big guy and there's no way guys even bigger than me have lung volume close to reproducing that kind of a concussion, that kind of a sound. The lungs I heard, the sound that I heard had to be made by a creature that had lungs the size of a horse. So that's why I think it must have been a huge Sasquatch behind me because Number one, the slope of that hollow that I was halfway down, and it was a big hollow too. 
That slope was too steep for a horse to even think about getting on unless it was really determined to get on that slope, number one. Number two, there was so much tree trash on that slope. I mean, tons of oak leaves and all sorts of other leaves and sticks and twigs. There's no way a horse could have gotten anywhere close to me without me hearing it. So what else has lung volume the size of a horse that could get that close to me without me ever hearing it? I think it must have been a Sasquatch. Now, again, I'm going to qualify that. I didn't see a Sasquatch, but if it wasn't a horse, if it wasn't a Sasquatch, what could it have been? So that was my first experience. And then my second experience, that happened, I guess, what, three, four years ago, I think it was. I was walking out in the country, and I was about maybe a quarter mile away from this bridge that goes up and over this creek. And it's more of a brook than a creek. It was so small, but I'm just walking and there's a green field on either side of me. And the green field was up about maybe six feet tall, whatever. So I could still look over it, but yeah, it did cut off a lot of what I could see on the other side of that green field. So I'm walking and Way up ahead, I see this black figure come up and over the bridge. And when it was jogging slash kind of running, it had this really strange gait. It was kind of like plucking its feet in a strange way up, kind of like a sewing machine fashion, plucking and plucking and plucking its feet up. And it was all black, again, in weather that didn't call for a sweatshirt or anything like that. So could it have been a person? Yeah, it might have been a person in all black. That's possible, but it's possible also it just might have been a Sasquatch. I don't know. So yeah, those are two experiences where I think it might have been a Sasquatch. The first one, I can't see what it could have been, but, but I never did see, definitively see that in the second encounter was a Sasquatch. And in the first encounter, I didn't see anything. Yeah. Yeah. That's why, you know, I think it's important not to always label everything, uh, you know, because once you're out there looking for Bigfoot, if you're actually out in the field looking for that, everything's a Bigfoot. OK. And I always say that on my shows. I'm like, you know, uh, if you go out looking for UFOs, everything in the sky is going to be a UFO, you know, or if you go out looking for Dogman, everything is going to be a Dogman. And there's so many things that can be you know, mislabeled or whatever. But if you're in an area where there's Bigfoot sightings and they are, they're known to be there and you know, they're there, uh, you don't have to see one face to face to know it's there. Uh, there's many ways to experience a Bigfoot. Okay. And, uh, and I'm walking proof of that right there um, because we experience them all the time. I mean, some people think that they're interdimensional beings. What do you think about that, Vic? Yeah, they just might be. It's hard to say. Anything's possible. I mean, that sure would explain a lot of the things they do. Yeah, a lot of the supernatural stuff. And now when I first came out publicly as a Bigfoot field researcher, which it took me 10 years to do. OK, but I finally did it. And, uh, and when I did, I came out kind of guns blazing, Vic. And I was saying, you know, from my experience, I think that they could be interdimensional beings. And there is a supernatural element to Sasquatch. Uh, and to pretty much all the cryptids. And speaking of cryptids, Cryptoville is in the chat. Uh, he's asking, ask Vic when he's going to come to the LBL and let let him show you around, please. He wants to show you around and be your tour guide. <laughs> well, thanks for the offer, but I don't have a life. I've got so much work <laughs> that I don't, have yeah, I don't have a life to do things like that. <laughs> oh my gosh. I know you're busy, man. Well, Cryptoville, I'll, t I'll take his place. Let me come up there. Okay. Show me around. If, if it can't come, I'll go. Okay. <laughs> huh. That is too funny. Cryptoville is funny. Okay. You're awesome. Thank you for being here, Cryptoville. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I absolutely believe and I, and I've seen with my own eyes, there is a, some sort of a supernatural element. Like how many stories do you get and encounters do you get where people ran into what they thought could be a cloaked Sasquatch? It happens, not all that often, but yeah, it does happen. And I think it's a shame. For the longest time, I just thought that was total nonsense. But as time has gone by, and you have so many credible eyewitnesses come forward and report seeing that, experiencing that, then, yeah, I mean, I think there has to be something to that. So yeah. I no longer dismiss that. I believe that it's entirely possible, just like I think anything is possible out there. 
Oh my gosh, it is. And uh, you know what I love, what warms my heart more than anything is watching people who have been in the primate in the woods camp, the flesh and blood, flesh and bone camp, graduate into the woo camp, <laughs> as we call it. And uh, and I think I think it's a beautiful thing because I mean I know that when I first went out for the first expedition I ever went on to go bigfooting with a, an actual team, I was looking for a primate in the woods, Vic. Okay, but I got a lot more than I bargained for. Okay, so uh, yeah, ha have you watched the progression of other people do that as well? And I call it a progression. I have, including people who I never thought would do that. The the one that tops the list as far as people who I'd never thought would come around and, and buy into the possibility that it's a reality. Or I guess I should say these are card-carrying believers now that that is the reality, would be Tim Kumbo Baker. I listen to a show. I'm an insomniac, so when I sleep oh, yeah. and, and then wake up and it's, okay, it's night shift. Yeah, that's enough sleep for now. I'll listen to Bigfoot <laughs> podcasts. And, yeah, a go-to for the longest time has been... Bigfoot Crossroads and also Bigfoot Outlaw Radio. Well, I think it was on an episode of Bigfoot Crossroads where Kumbo talked about how there was an experience that Tal Branco shared with him. And I guess in this experience, he watched one cloak and it was like a process he watched where there was like a shimmering effect in its fur and then the fur started to disappear bit by bit. And then you could see its internals, you could see its organs, and then it just basically eventually vanished. Wow. And then Kumbo talked about witnessing Sasquatch running into like a an impenetrable thicket. And when they hit that thicket and disappeared into it, there wasn't a single leaf that wavered even. Nothing moved. And just he's laid out things like that, that he's witnessed and experienced over the years that wound up making him coming around in being a card carrying believer in the existence of what some people call woo. So yeah, yeah he's definitely the yeah. one that I thought would be the last one to ever right. buy into this, but he does believe it now. Yeah. Well, speaking of the woo, we have Dave Scott from spaced out radio in the chat. Thank you for that super chat, Dave. Hi, we, I know who you're, I know who you are, Dave. I see you. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah. You know, uh, my team, we've documented a portal out in the field, and we do believe that um, some of the cryptids are utilizing Earth's natural portals, potentially. Um, it, it's just a thing. I know there's a, a lot more research needs to be done, and my team's out there doing it at this moment. We're, we're still researching um, on that. But, I mean, everything from stargates to portals to holographic covers over doors and things. I mean, th this world is so wild, Vic, and uh, and it's there's, there's just so much that we don't know. Um, but, but yeah, it's, I love talking about these things though. Absolutely. Also the fact that Sasquatch, some of their hair, some people say has chlorophyll in it. Okay. Which would, I, I mean, some say also they turn into trees or they use trees as a portal. Have you gotten reports of that where there's a connection between Sasquatch and trees? Well, recently I had a credible eyewitness come on one of the shows and I think he came on my Bigfoot sighting. No, I guess he came on Bigfoot Eyewitness Radio. That's right. He came on Bigfoot Eyewitness Radio and talked about seeing a stump with eyes. And from time to time, I'll have that where they start off like that, and then they kind of transform into a Sasquatch. Now, I'm not sure how much of that is looking like a stump because of holding its body a particular way and the lay of its hair on its body and all that. And it just looks like it's a stump there instead of it actually physically appearing to be a stump legitimately and then all of a sudden shape-shifting into their their form of being a sasquatch i don't know much is behind all that but it does happen i do have people contact me and report that yeah i have a, a personal friend one of the guys who's on one of my research teams he has a story of his uncle i think it was his great uncle or his uncle uh they live down here in the South. I'm down here in the South. Okay. And, uh, and he said, there's a story they've, that he told me firsthand of his uncle. Evade, let's just say that he was evading the police. Okay. And he ran out the back of the house when the cop showed up at his house and, uh, and he ran into the backyard. And as he passed behind a tree, a dog, like a wolf came out of the other side of the tree and it ran into the woods. 
Okay. And, uh, and then he said that when the cops left, the dog trotted back from the woods and that went behind that tree and his uncle emerged out the other side of it. I mean, there's, there's weird stuff going on and I'm not, I'm not saying he was a dog man, but he went, <laughs> kind of sounded like he went from a man to a dog, you know? Um, but yeah, there's just a lot of different facets to, to the whole dog man thing. And, um, and that may have some ties to, you know, black magic or something. Um, if you believe in that and I believe in it, <laughs> there's, there's some weird ritual stuff going that goes on in this world for sure. Oh, sure. Yeah. It wouldn't surprise mm -hmm. me. <laughs> the older I yeah. get, the more I realize, come to the realization that, yeah, the world's not what we've been told it is. It's a lot more complicated. Uh, complicated. Complicated is a good word. Yes. Complicated, majestic. I mean, just wonderful. I, I love, I love being here at this time right now. I know we're going through some weird stuff, but, um, but I'm here for the ride. Okay. I'm here for the ride and, uh, and trying to unravel some of these mysteries. Now, Vic, I mean, we've got a few more minutes today. Somebody has sent me some videos. Okay. I, I don't have them uploaded today, but I've been sent videos of what appear to be dog men. Okay. But, okay. One of them. Yes. I do believe it could be a dog man, uh, that's running and it's jumping and it moves interestingly and it goes on two legs. The other videos look a lot like rodent humans. Okay, have you seen those videos yet where they're claiming that those are dog men, but they look like rat humans, kind of? No, I haven't seen those, but <laughs> okay. understand. I mean, I don't really get into the the media like that, the pictures, yeah. the videos. I've had things like that that have been shared with me over the years that are so impressive that, yeah, it takes a lot to even come close to moving the needle for me. So that's why I don't really get into pictures or videos. I have people contact me all the time. Vic, I've got a picture you're going to see. It's going to blow you away. You've got to yeah. see this video. And I'm thinking, well, I really doubt that. I'm sure it's really important to you. But, yeah, I mean, I'm just more focused on trying to help the eyewitnesses come to terms with their encounters with dog right. men than to see the next dog man picture that's out there or the, the next dog man video that's been taken. So, yeah, it just hasn't really been anything that I... I get into anymore, but no, I haven't seen those pictures to answer your question. Okay. What is the, and I, I've already heard you on another show before. Uh, I, I just love listening to your stories and uh, your accounts. Tell me about the most impressive dog man footage you've ever seen, please. Oh, that's easy. <laughs> yeah. Back, I think about eight years ago, was it? Eight years ago. No, I guess it was in 2000. 2000 and well yeah i guess it was seven or eight years ago anyway there was a guy who he found out or a friend of his found out that in the foothills of the sierra nevada mountains there was a dog man hanging around or dogman plural hanging around well either he or a friend of his took this game cam that was more expensive you know the more expensive ones you can set them up to not only snap photos when they detect motion but also film if you want them to start filming when they detect motion well either he or this buddy of his strapped this game cam to a tree trunk and then he or his buddy hung this bait about five feet away from the camera lens on this branch well either later that day or maybe the next day or something like that in broad daylight, it just looked like a sunny afternoon from left to right. You see this dog man come walking into view of the camera between the camera lens and that bait. So it was quite a bit less than five feet away from the camera lens. I got to see it from the front. I got to see it from the back when it turned around to go for the bait. And I could see actually individual hairs on its body. It was kind of like a coyote-ish, timber wolfish gray. So like at the base of the hairs, it was kind of like a dirty gray. And on some of the hairs, not all of them, but on some of the hairs, they were kind of tipped in brownish or chocolate. And I was so blown away by this video, I contacted this guy back and it was shared to me via private YouTube video. So the public couldn't access it, but if he would send the link to you, you could. Well, I contacted him back and said, hey, would you mind if I shared this video with a guy I know who had just been on an episode of Dogman Encounters, actually episode six, Richard mm -hmm. Eady is this researcher's name who specializes in analyzing footage of 
Dogman and Sasquatch. Would you mind if I share this video with Richard Eady to get his opinion on the validity of it? Validity of this. He said, "Sure, by all means." So I sent it to Richard, and yeah, I was on the phone with him when he opened it up and was watching it for the first time, and it blew him away. He's like, "Holy cow!" I mean, it was just an amazing video. So yeah, ever wow. since then, nothing has really moved the needle for me after seeing that. Oh, I can only imagine. Now, did it have a head? Did the head? I have so many questions. Did it look more like a German Shepherd or like a Husky, or did it have human attributes to it? Yeah, there weren't really any human attributes to it. It was kind of like a cross between a wolf head and maybe somewhat of a German Shepherd type head on it. But yeah, there wasn't anything to it at all that would remind you of a human okay. at all. Okay, what what kind of intelligence do you think the dogmen have? Uh, like human intelligence, dog intelligence, somewhere in between, or more intelligent than humans? Well, I think their intelligence would really surprise most people. I think they're intelligent beyond belief. I think their intelligence might rival ours. In some ways, it might supersede ours. So they're very intelligent. If you look at the things that they do, if you look at the things they do, they have to be awfully intelligent. Yeah, I would, I would think so. I, to me, it sounds like they have like a kind of a human element to them, but I've never experienced one firsthand uh, that I know of. I've never seen one. So, um, yeah, and I, I hear they have hands that look like raccoons. Is that true? Well, some do. Others have hands that look pretty, pretty much like what you would expect a werewolf's hands to look like. I mean kind of like human hands with knobby knuckles and then they've got the talons on the tips of their fingers and all the long talons. So yeah, yeah they have variances, not only how their heads look, but how their hands look. And I guess you could call them paws if they have paws slash hands like a raccoon. So they have different looks to them. Pause for the cause. Absolutely. Well, my goodness. I mean, this hour has really flown by and I feel like I have a million more questions for you big while you're here but but um why don't you uh tell the audience exactly where they can uh, find all of your podcasts and your shows my i mean i know you your whole life revolves around doing shows and podcasts and i commend you for that that you, you're putting so much information out there and it's so important right now uh just for not only for to put the information out for disclosure purposes uh, but for people to be aware of what's going on in the world and it's an outlet for people to tell their stories and uh and to kind of release some of that trauma of uh, of the events that happened uh, when they had those encounters. So thank you for doing that. I think that you're doing a, a big service to the world right now. And uh, and I love that. So thank you, Vic. Um, well, if thanks you for just, the good words. Absolutely. If you could just kind of go over all of your podcasts and uh, in your shows so our audience can go subscribe. Well, I produce four podcasts, like you said a bit ago. The biggest one is Dogman Encounters. All these, all four podcasts are available on every podcast platform out there. iHeart, Stitcher when they used to be around, Spreaker, Spotify. You pick a podcast platform, whichever one is your favorite, and you can listen to all four of my shows on that platform. My shows are Dogman Encounters Radio. Uh, I've got my Bigfoot Sighting. That's my newest Bigfoot show, which is really growing by leaps and bounds. And then you've got my other Bigfoot show, which has been around since 2016. That is Bigfoot Eyewitness Radio. And then you've got my newest show, which is called My Paranormal Experience, where we cover everything that doesn't have to do with dogmen or Sasquatch, UFO abductions, strange creatures that are seen out in the woods. Yeah, ghost sightings and encounters from the ground up. If it's out there, it's on that show. But yeah, Dogman Encounters, My Bigfoot Sighting, Bigfoot Eyewitness Radio, and My Paranormal Experience, all four are available on every podcast platform out there. Three of those, all the shows except for Bigfoot Eyewitness Radio, are also available on YouTube. So yeah. they're all really easy to find and listen to. Oh, yeah. And you have a big old audience, man. I love it. And uh, it just means that you're you're reaching a big audience to to really get the word out. And uh, I, and I like to really 
not just like warn people about what's going on in our woods and our national forests and stuff. Uh, we have a lot of people going missing, you know, out of out of our woods and our forests. So, um, you know, and I don't want people to be scared. Y'all don't be scared to go out in the woods. I go out in the woods all the time and, uh, and I'm still here. We're good. Uh, but just be aware of your surroundings. Do you have any advice for the audience before you go today, Vic, um, on, you know, just to protect people, protect ourselves from dogmen? Let's just put it that way. Any advice? Well, I always tell people when I'm asked about how to handle a dogman encounter, I would just treat it like you would treat encountering a grizzly bear. Don't do anything to make it think that you're challenging its dominance. Don't run from it. I'd recommend turning sideways and not making direct eye contact with it because that can bring on a sort of host of other problems in and of itself if you make that mistake. But anyway, yeah, monitor where it's at and then safely try to just leave the area in a calm as possible manner. If you're having a dog in the counter, of course, it's going to be hard to remain calm. But yeah, try to <laughs> leave the area in a controlled fashion while monitoring the dog man. These guys, they normally want to be behind you. So yeah, that's why it's a good idea, in my opinion, to kind of turn sideways and monitor them as you're leaving the area. But awesome. that's what I would recommend. Wow. Okay. I can appreciate that. That's awesome. And uh, and if you don't want a dogman encounter, you guys, uh, I don't know, just don't go in the woods by yourself at night. Okay. Please don't go in the woods by yourself. Uh, but there's so much more we could talk about. Vic, please come back and join me on another show. I would love to to have you back on uh, at your at your convenience sometime. If you would if you would do that. Oh, I'd love to come back. Yeah. Okay. Just say the word and I'll be here. Oh, I'm going to say the word. Don't you worry. We're going to have you back on soon. Okay, Vic. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Okay. Well, thank you guys so much for being here today. This has been a fantastic show. Thank you to everybody who is in the chat today and all my moderators. And thank you so much for those super chats and super stickers. You guys are the best. Uh, I appreciate y'all. Please come back here tomorrow night at 8 p.m. Eastern. Uh, I have James Rink and Jimmy Payne joining me for part two of our vampire series. And we're going to be talking about reanimated corpses. And Jimmy has some firsthand experience with that stuff. So this is going to be wild. You don't want to miss it. It's October, y'all. It's Halloween, right? We're, we started Halloween this week. <laughs> All right. Well, Vic, thanks again for being here today. I will see you guys tomorrow night. Y'all have a great day. And um, I don't know if y'all are turning your devices off today, but it's about time. All right. I'll see y'all later. Bye y'all.